I'm your host, Bradley Martin, and this is Clearing the Way, a resource for small business owners. A couple quick notes uh, about the first two or three episodes, um, maybe four. Uh, you're going to notice some echo in the first couple. It gets better. Um, after that first one, really, we I, I've made some adjustments. The echo is definitely gone after that first one or, or better after the first one. Um, and then there's some some camera troubles or uh, just some issues in the first couple. Uh, first one, you're going to notice some fantastic uh, autofocus box on mic. Uh, and then the second episode, there's also a little bit of an autofocus issue, but uh, I think I got that squared away after that. So um, after episode four, I believe, uh, or the fourth guest episode, all of that should be squared away. And I'm going to continue to make some uh, adjustments so that this uh, this all gets better. Hello, humans. Welcome back to Clearing the Way. I'm your host, Bradley Martin. Uh, my goal is to uncover the challenges that small business owners face along their way uh, so that you can be better prepared when you experience something similar. My guest today is Cliff Wansettler, founder of Wansettler Physical Therapy. Cliff attended Penn State University, where he wrestled till he suffered a neck injury. Uh, he graduated in 2004 with a bachelor's in kinesiology and exercise science, Cliff went on to become a doctor of physical therapy at the University of Pittsburgh. He spent over nine years in conventional physical therapy. In 2019, he opened Juan Settler Physical Therapy with the desire to take a more holistic approach to physical therapy, a place where mind, body, and spirit could be changed for the better. His team has grown quickly to a total of seven physical therapists uh, and seven support staff. I met Cliff right uh, right around the time when he was planning. Um, We used to go to the same coffee shop. So planning, preparing. Um, so I've kind of been able to observe from the outside and we've worked together since. So, um, so that's why I thought it'd be great to have him on. Cliff, thank you for uh, coming on the show. Thanks for being a guest. You'll be episode number two. All right. On Clearing <laughs> Your Life. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Excited so, to be here. So, um, so let's, let's start um, I've got some of your background information here. Did I miss anything up there? No, you got it all right. Good? Cool. Although we're at eight PTs now, so eight. Okay, yeah. okay, I missed that. <laughs> um, so um, let's start as a student um, way back. So let's start like as a kid. The goal is let's figure out how you um, how you got to the point where you decided that you were going to be the one that that employs yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so as a student, uh, through school, obviously you played sports, but, um, how were you, uh, were you a good student, bad student? What kind of grades did you get? Um, were you a studier? You know, what, what was kind of your, um, your school, your school situation? School like? All right. Going way back. Uh, way back. Yeah. So I think that school was pretty natural for me. Both of my parents were teachers and it was an expectation, like you better get straight A's type thing. And, and certainly incentivized to do so. It was like a hundred bucks for all straight A's okay, on, a, on each report card and each, nice. each nine, uh, nine weeks. So that was like enough motivation that I needed to, to make it happen. It was that all the way through like think, elementary school. Like I can't remember when that started, probably okay. like middle school or something like that. It okay. was, I don't know if it was elementary, but, uh, yeah, both my that's parents were pretty, That's a pretty good. Oh time. yeah. You know, 25 plus years ago, that was, that was you yeah. know, more than, more than worth it for me at least. So, um, but that said, like school was always pretty easy for me. One of my brothers, I've, I've got two younger brothers, and one of them, super studious, really like focused on his studies, never missed, you know, like he took any opportunity. We'd be at, like a wrestling tournament, and he'd be up in the stands in between matches doing his homework and like doing math problems and stuff like that. That was never me. Like I just spent almost no time outside of school doing school stuff, you know. That's... But I still got good grades. I, yeah. you know, it was not as, um, difficult for me to make some of those things happen now whether i learned anything or not it's kind of a different story you know? yeah like, that's i was pretty pretty similar really? um in that i didn't really do much outside of school i did everything i needed to yeah. but i also was able to get pretty good grades mm-hmm. which to your point i don't know if i learned much because mm-hmm. of that and i was not set up well in college because i had no idea how to study like yeah. once things actually got challenging i had no idea how to handle it mm-hmm. um Okay, so so good student, mm-hmm. uh, good, we'll say, good you know, enough. good enough student, <laughs> uh, kind of natural. Um, 
you wrestled? Did you any other sports? Did you do anything else? In high school, I played football as well. What, and, what uh, position? I played, believe it or not, I weighed like 195 pounds, you know, but I was a fullback. Okay. Okay. Fullback and a middle linebacker. But I went to a super small school. I graduated with like 100 kids. So it was like, there was not a, uh, <laughs> there was not like a, a, a large pool of, of big, yeah. big kids to, to pull from in order to, uh, you know, buy for a, a spot like yeah. on, you know, playing linebacker or fullback. But um, yeah, I love football. I mean, I, I've always said that if I would have had as much success in football in high school that I did with wrestling, I would have probably played football in, in college if I huh. had the opportunity just because I thought it was a blast, you know. Wrestling is a really, you're kind of alone all yeah. the time. Like it's, it's a very individualized sport, obviously. Yeah. And uh, football is just, you know, you're with your buddies and it's a little more, it's obviously way more team sport. It's just way more, at least in my situation, way more like camaraderie with yeah. my boys. And Yeah. That, uh, I feel like that's always the thing that people, um, people kind of go back to is like the things they miss from those, those team sports, mm-hmm. which I'm not sure I've had. Uh, like, do you get that at all? The same camaraderie at all from, I mean, there's some piece of that cause you are on a team with mm-hmm. wrestling, but sure. what this obviously has nothing to do with business side of it, but it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Do you get, is it similar? Do you have any of the same types of, of like camaraderie feelings or the, the after fact, after the fact, I guess that's, the, I guess that's kind of when you notice that. Do you miss any of the camaraderie from that, or is it not even the same as more of that team sport like football? Does that in, make sense? in college, yeah, it does. Okay. And in college, I had a ton of that. I mean, all my all my buddies were on the wrestling team. We the, the bond was strong. You know what I'm saying? Like it was it was a tight group of us. We yeah. Did I don't know? I have very few friends that through college that were not on on the wrestling team with me. Okay. You're spending a ton of time with them. It's just a way different thing. And everybody's really committed to the same mission. Like everybody's yeah. trying to get better. Everyone wants to be, you know, all, all American national champ. Like that's, you've got a similar goal and vision. But for me at least, and I went to a really small school. My brothers and I were really the only, like anybody that wrestled in college, there was nobody else on my team that it was even, that was not even a thought at yeah. all. So when you're kind of on an island in terms of like what your pursuits are and what you're chasing after, and there's nobody else that's kind of sharing that with you. That's you tough. feel, you know, you yeah, feel by yourself, you feel alone. And so, um, I didn't really, and then, you know, like there was a club scene and, and, um, I wrestled with some guys that were from other schools that, that we would, you know, wrestle in the summer together or something like that. But, you know, there's a yeah. distance thing and there wasn't just like a, yeah, I didn't, so I didn't have like this yeah. really close group of friends in high school that were wrestlers on, on a shared mission or shared, yeah. you know, trajectory but um yeah okay um so from um so then you you went to penn state um did you when you went there did you plan on me on on did you plan uh, did everything kind of go according to plan i guess did you plan on becoming a physical therapist when you went to school like was was that the path yeah Um, not at all i mean i I don't even know (laughs) I, i had never seen a physical therapist myself i mean I couldn't even tell you if, if you'd asked me when I was in a senior in high school, like, what's a physical therapist? I don't know if I'd be able to answer the question. I, okay. I have no idea. Okay, so what, what, what was the plan? <laughs> so you went to, like, at what point did you decide uh, kinesiology and exercise science? Like, yeah. what, what was the... Oh, I think I went, like, through four or five different major... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. ...major pursuits. Like, I didn't even declare a major. It was all through my first year, my freshman year in college, where I was like, maybe I want to do business. Maybe I want to do nutrition. And I was thinking, like, Maybe some kind of, I had no idea, you know what I mean? I yeah. just, I really didn't know. Okay. And then toward the beginning, or maybe at the end of my freshman year, beginning of my sophomore year in college, I was like, maybe I want to be uh, a teacher and a, a wrestling coach. That was my dad. Like, that was the path that he had yeah. gone on. Um, he was my wrestling coach. So, I mean, I, I loved gym class when I was a kid. That was that was what he taught. Kind of seemed like it could be a good fit. So, I I started taking a couple of educational um, yeah, education classes that were like kind of geared toward phys ed, physical education. And, and that was kinesiology. So I, I started taking some of those classes and then I had to do one of the, one of the classes I took required um, shadowing for, for phys ed classes, like at elementary, middle school and high school level. So I, I did that for three different, you good? Yeah. Okay. Good. Three yeah. different, um, three different schools. And after that, it was like a weekend, like a long week or something like that. 
And I was like, no way. I'm, I'm totally out on that. Like every single kid hated gym class. Uh-huh. They didn't want to be there. It was like, it was a total, total eye opener for me. Like how most kids saw phys ed. Yeah. I loved it, man. I was like, let me outside. Yeah, let me play. It's like not a study hall, but like, this is the period where yeah. we're like, Goof this off. is my break like, I, just, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to be doing any of this stuff, but I don't have to be sitting in class. And, and it was like a totally, it was like I said, an eye opener. So it completely switched gears for me in terms of the trajectory I wanted to take. I knew I didn't want to do that anymore, or at least I really felt like I felt strongly I didn't want to. So I was taking a biology course at the time. I think it was my sophomore year. And, and this guy, my professor was like, you, re- you should really consider PT. Uh, check it out. So I started like just doing probably some reading. I still, again, I shadowed nobody. I, I had no idea really what PT did other than just some search online probably. Yeah. Um, and talking to some, some friends and a couple of, professors and advisors and and so i i decided to change direction i was still in kinesiology but i i switched my like focus so it was i think it was a can't remember what they called like movement science option okay so at penn state so i uh i went that route applied to pt school um got in so what year was that that you made that decision i I think it was the end of my sophomore year okay Mm -hmm. wow okay so then that's pretty pretty did was there any um any issue with I guess at that point, like credit wise, did you run into any issues there? No, to graduate. Kind no, of? I was all good. Okay. Like I was able to get all the, the credits I needed. That's nice. Once I found out that I was going to pursue that and I was able to get all the, everything in like without much issue. Uh, although like the first time I'd ever really probably been in a physical therapy clinic was the very last semester of my senior year in college. I had to do 240 shadow hours or something like that. And so I did that at sports medicine complex in, in, uh, in the South side of Pittsburgh where the Steelers complex is. And that was my first exposure to PT in really any way. And uh, thankfully, I enjoyed being in there and I, I enjoyed working <laughs> yeah. with patients and just getting to know them and trying to help them out in whatever capacity I could at the time. You know, I wasn't a PT, obviously, but yeah. uh, just the environment was fun. You know, I, the, the two things that I knew about myself enough to, to like kind of steer my decision making as a um, – student was that I didn't want to sit at a desk all day. I knew that for sure. Yeah. That was, that's helpful. Yeah. That was a good place to start. It was a good place to start. And then I wanted to help people. I just knew that I wanted to be able to do something of service. And obviously that can be a million different things. Um, but those were the two criteria that I had for myself and thankfully, you know, PT fit that and, and all the other things that you need to consider kind of fell in place too, in terms of what my interests were. So, I mean, some of that backstory was that I had, I had an injury. I had, hurt my neck. You mentioned that in the intro, but hurt my neck, had surgery at the beginning of my sophomore year. And so that kind of sparked an interest in like sports medicine, yeah. and rehab, though did, I'd did only you done that with prior to that. Any, like nothing substantial, no, yeah. nothing that I really needed any rehab for or, or anything like that. So that was my first and that was my last too. That was like the end of my competition. Was days. there any piece of that? Like when you were going through after the surgery, was there any, any part of that that was like, Oh, this is this is either um, positive, like, okay, this is something I'm interested in, um, or this is something that could probably be done a little bit better. Was, was Did any of that kind of get sparked at that point or no? I don't think uh, – it's it's hard for me to retroactively okay. look and, and analyze how I would have felt because really, truthfully, the athletic trainer that was there at the time, he really misdiagnosed the injury because yeah. it had gone on for like four or five months, and he was just treating it, never referred me out to the – to the mm. team doc to really get some, you yeah. know, some imaging or MRI or something like that. And he really, like I said, dropped the ball. So it, it's, it skews my perspective in terms of what I would have yeah. thought at the time, but I don't think that there was like any big takeaways, you know, for me uh, to say like, Oh yeah, this is, this is it. Or, or there's a way better option. For yeah. This. Okay. Um, so I graduated Penn state um, and then went to Pitt. Mm-hmm. Um, was, at that point, had you figured out the so you you knew at that point physical therapy was kind of what you were you were headed towards. Mm-hmm. Um, what led to the decision to continue that um, continue that education? Was there any was that just kind of the natural path or what? Um, yeah, how how did you come to that? Yeah, the, the, really, the the movement science option I think is what it was called at the, uh, with the kinesis degree was like. <laughs> It should have been called like you've got you've got to go to graduate school. <laughs> it wasn't like any option. I guess you could maybe work in in a research lab and be like some kind of assistant or something like that in a 
human movement lab or something Okay. Um, with just an undergrad <laughs> okay. degree, but pretty much every option in that option was graduate school, whether okay. you went into okay. medical well, school or PT. Did you know that or was yeah, that? Yeah, okay. I, I did know okay. that. I, and okay. I knew I wanted to go to PT school. So, and I knew that that was an extra three years on top of, of um, undergrad. So it was simple. I mean, but I think, you know, really it was like medical school, physical therapy school, become a physician's assistant and do two years of graduate school through that route. That was, those were like kind of the three big options okay. most people were looking at. Okay. Um, anything of note, uh, at your time at Pitt, anything or just kind of, um, anything, yeah. Anything of note there? Yeah. I just... think the biggest thing in terms of, as it relates to, to the topic on this podcast, especially is I remember sitting in this class and I don't really remember the exact context of, of what was being said. Uh, I, I remember it was this course that I just really didn't like. I didn't like the structure and the, like the rigid um, rule set that was being taught in terms of like how to, again, like the exact um, delivery of the coursework I, I was not clear to me. But I remember yeah. like thinking and saying to my two friends that I always sat next to, if, if I'm not a business owner, if I don't have my own practice in 10 years, I don't think I'm going to be a PT because I just didn't think that it suited me to like um, follow somebody else's rules. Uh -huh. And have to be confined in terms of how what, what your options, what my options were, how I wanted to do what I wanted to do, yeah. and and also just uh, I, I didn't really see myself being able to just treat patients for the an entirety of a career. And some people yeah. love that, and, and thank God that there are people like that. Yeah, doctors, PTs, yeah. you know, you name it. Um, but it just wasn't me. I just kind of knew that of myself, like early on before I was ever a PT. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's good that you noticed it at that point because that kind of allows you, um, which I'm sure we'll get to, but it allows you, your approach to the next, like taking a job mm -hmm. is way different then. Yeah. Because you know the end goal is, oh, I'm going to have my own thing. Mm -hmm. So I got to soak up, like I got to figure out how the rest of this works. I'm not just a, a physical therapist. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I can do this as soon as possible for myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's good that, that you realize that, I mean, it wasn't super early, but it was before you had to start working. Which, yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. No, it really served me well. I mean, it also allowed me some, like the first five years out of PT school, a buddy, a buddy of mine and I, we, we traveled around the country as, as PTs, we'd do like short-term contracts. So three to five months, we'd stay in one place and we'd move together kind of cool. We're in Hawaii and Austin and Boston and Chicago and everywhere else in between. So it was tremendous. Like, I feel like I had, because I had a long-term plan to some degree, it was loose, you know, but I, yeah. I had some type of long-term vision, but it allowed me to be like, you know what? I don't have to like have this all nailed down. Let's, let's have some fun first and just yeah. like appreciate, um, the world a little bit more than I ever had. Like I was probably never West of Iowa until I was, you know, in, in, out of PT school. Yeah. So, uh, it was, it was a really good opportunity to be able to, you know, move around experience life in a different way. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So during that time, um, so you already knew that you were going to be starting something eventually. Mm -hmm. What was the, obviously you were, um, like you said, you know, it allows you to kind of have a little bit of fun during that time. Mm -hmm. what, was there anything you were trying to like, were you approaching those? What did we say? Like nine years that you were working. Um, did you approach that in a pretty like strategic way of like, I need to learn these things or, um, how, how did you approach that? And what, what did you kind of learn through, um, yeah, through that, that time of actually having to work for, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for somebody else. The last four years, it was really tr strategic. I was like, I, I knew I need, I need to take a position where I had some kind of management exposure and, and just understood some of the non-clinical side of things, you know, just looking at PL. I mean, I don't think I'd ever heard that term yeah. until I took, I did an interview for this management role that I took in Seattle. Um, my wife's from Seattle. So we, we moved back there. We were living in Chicago at a time for the time and, and uh, moved back to Seattle with the intention of, of, you know, being closer to her family. And also I was going to take a job like doing some kind of management so I can prepare myself for starting my own practice. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, it was, it was, that was a really intentional uh, decision to be able to get my mind around, okay, how, how am I going to make this all work and like yeah. start to put the pieces of the puzzle together? Huh? Okay. Um, all right, well then let's get to, so 2019 was that actually, so I, when I saw that, 
Is that actually when you opened or was that when you were, because I feel like that's around the time, I don't know, was that actually when you opened the doors or was that when you were still in the planning building phase out, planning stuff. and all that? Yeah, we did open. We opened in okay. February of 2019. Okay. So I think we established, that makes sense. We established it uh, as a practice in 2018 at some point. I don't, I don't remember the exact timeline there, but we, we had been sense. in business in 2018 and, and we built, you know, I kind of like put all my chips in the center of the table with this business. Most like I was, I went to the bank, tried to get this loan for the big building that we uh-huh. built and they were really hesitant to, to loan the money because I had no background in owning my own practice, uh-huh. no business experience, like business ownership experience yeah. at all. And I wanted a, a big chunk of change to build this <laughs> building that, and it's like, I mean, we built this, you know, for some context it really removed from the population in terms of like density, yeah. you know, yeah, compression. You're not, you're not in like a high, I mean, the road is high traffic, but right. like there's not a lot going on. No, there's no, not it's, a lot. It's going pretty on rural. There. Yeah. It's, it's really rural, rural actually. Yeah. I can see how that would be a little bit of a concern for a bank. Yeah. The bank uh, was like, no, we, uh, we don't want to do that. You should really consider doing it in like, you know, a, a more populated uh, area or more densely populated area. There's more traffic and this and that. Yeah. And I just, I just really didn't want to do that. I want, I knew for one kind of selfishly, I, I wanted to, cause I knew it was going to be a ton of work and a ton of time I, I had to commit. And at the time, I think we had two, two kids. We've got three now and one on the way, Congrats. but I knew for sure I was going to just be like totally immersed in, in getting this thing off the ground and, and wanting to commit every ounce of energy I had when yeah. it wasn't work, you know, when, when I wasn't spending time with the family, which wasn't a ton, to be honest with you. Yeah. So if I was like 20 minutes away from my family, yeah, uh, I, I would see them even form. less, you yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah. um, I mean, when we first opened, like if I had a minute, I'd, I'd go see the family and, and I could see yeah. them a couple of times throughout the day that I just wouldn't have had the opportunity to do if I was again, 20, 15, 20 minutes away. So, yeah. um, that was part of the decision. Then the other thing too, and, and, for some, some background, like I grew up really, really close to where the clinic, my, my physical therapy clinic is. And that's kind of the little center of the sphere of influence that, that I have. And that my family has, you know, again, I mentioned that both my parents were teachers. They were teachers in the the local school. And I mean, they, we have like seven generations of, of my family that have lived in that same area. So there's a lot of like familiarity there's yeah. there's not a ton of turnover in that area so the name carries some weight yeah and i knew that that would i thought i wasn't sure but yeah. I, I had yeah, yeah. some inclination that that was going to kickstart us and give us some momentum right out of the gate that i would not have otherwise because i yeah. think that having establishing trust is one of the most difficult things for a business and i yeah. think that there was an inherent trust because a lot of people knew my family, knew my parents specifically yeah. like them. They're good, integral people that really are trustworthy and, and made a difference in a lot of kids' lives as teachers. And so there was a built in degree of trust. It had nothing to do with me personally. It was just, yeah, just the association. Name. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, I did think that, that was going to mean something. And I think it turned out that it did because it really helped us get going right away. Yeah. Well, and also the, the spot that you're at, it kind of, um, we talked about it a lot, but like the idea of a place that isn't just the physical therapy, like it isn't just physical therapy. It, mm. It's that more holistic approach, like the a shopping mall or a shopping plaza building doesn't really doesn't really give that vibe. Where no, you've got totally this uninspiring. cool building, like high ceilings, big big full windows on the back, like it's a cool. It gives that like, okay, this is different. Mm-hmm. This is different. And they actually kind of care. Um, not that others don't, but it, it just, it, it, it gives it a different, a different feel than a doctor's office. Cause it doesn't feel like a doctor's office yeah, not at, all. at all. No, I, th- I really do think that we think that environment matters. I mean, the, the, the space you're in will influence how you feel. It'll yeah. influence your, your perception. It's all going to match up or we feel like it needs to match up. Like yeah. if, if we're focused on, putting a lot of energy into you as a person and we're spending a ton of time with you and, and we're committed to helping change your mental state, your physical state and change the trajectory of your health, which is what we're trying to do as PTs yeah. and, and specifically how we're, how we're operating. If you're in, if, if we're saying that and we're trying to do that in, in our interactions with our patients and you're in this like 
low ceiling, depressing environment, eight foot drop ceilings that just like are bearing down on you. And yeah, you're just, that doesn't inspire hope and like some optimism for the future. It doesn't invite light into mm-hmm. it, in, into your world and into the space. And we feel like that, that will influence again, how you, how you yeah. see yourself into the future, because that's really what you're trying to do is, is change your trajectory, change your state and, and create a new future for yourself. Yeah. Well, and that's also, that's something that saying that to the banks is like hey yeah <laughs> oh we're gonna give you more money because of that like, yeah sure that makes sense but also like we can't we're not giving you the money because yeah. of that like yeah but i mean obviously at this point like it seems like you made the right made the right call yeah, not that you had much of a choice like it was either kind of follow the bank's instruction mm-hmm. and be able to get yeah the and rent space or, in a strip mall or something like that or, yeah. or do what we did yeah and, and yeah the, you're right the bank is not they're not like thinking about all the yeah those, those the soft t- yeah. things that, yeah. that really it's hard to put a number on it's hard to be objective about you know what i mean yeah you can't gauge uh not easily at least you can't engage you can't, or gauge yeah. rather how it's effective. tough to quantify vibe yeah totally. <laughs> <laughs> that's a well well like, that's a good way okay. to say it um, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. That that vibe is worth a million dollars. Uh-huh. It's like what? Based on what? Like, <laughs> based on what? How are we gonna? How do we tell that to our boss? Right. Um, but I mean, I think it's borne out. So we've got so much, so many data points from people, our patients, actually telling us that. That yeah. That I think it's really been borne out in in some of the evidence in terms of how we quantified vibe. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. So so you open in 2019, um, which I think was we met before that because yeah, you so. were still building wasn't done. There was a lot. So I guess we probably met in like 2018. Probably so. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm, that's int- OK. Um, so so you open um, now. Let's get to kind of the fun part. Um, what kind of so you, did you. When you left your previous employer beforehand, did you have client? I guess, um, yeah. Did you have clients that follow that, or did you? Were you starting from scratch? Like how? Because that's normally that every time. That's always the the question. Like, well, how do I get clients? Like, mm-hmm. how do I start? And you're like, you can't just freelance that thing. You know, <laughs> you can't no. just freelance physical therapy. I don't think. No. So, did. Yeah. How, like, did you start with clients? How did that, how did that first couple months play out as far as actually bringing people in? Yeah. I tried to get some clients to follow me from Seattle, but nobody, nobody did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, our la- my last gig as a physical therapist was in Seattle. So we moved across the country, packed up our house in this mm. big moving trailer thing and, and came across country, built this building. It took almost a year to build it. So I was like, I, I almost, it was nearly a year. I didn't even work as a PT. I was just trying to build this building and get it off the ground, get it open as soon as I could mm-hmm. so I could start paying it off, you know? And um, so I had I had no clients. It was really like, I mean, the bank may have said these words or something like that, but it was really like we were trying to do a field of dream scenario where it was like, <laughs> you build it and then hope that they come. We really, that was like our motto, which it sounds asinine to think that that would be like the it's your business risky. plan. It's pretty risky. risky. But I, I really did believe that like, Again, just the, the the momentum we would have have out of the gate um, with the network and then the recognition uh, name recognition for yeah. my family's name. I thought it would I thought it would go, you know. So uh, once we it was all hands on deck to get that building done, and uh, we we opened in February 2019, and just and we started you know some different things, trying to let people know on social media and just word of mouth, and uh, we didn't have like any we didn't have any like physicians in our in our back pocket so to speak like gonna send us a bunch of patients yeah. i had no relationships with any physicians like nothing formal at least mm-hmm. didn't pay any visits to any doctor's offices and that wasn't like i'm not suggesting that's the, <laughs> yeah. the right way to go yeah. here it's just what it's just how yeah. it went yeah. down you know yeah and when you, uh, so when you started that was it just um it was you and was it your brother was yeah. it both of you was it just you two did you have anybody else on initially it was just me treating patients he had okay. just moved back from montana and uh, he's like seven years younger than me. So he was working out there as a PT, just started his career as a PT. had just graduated from PT school at Pitt too. And working in Montana, moved back and uh, kind of in the middle of the build. So he helped me finish the building. And then he was he was still waiting on his license to come through in Pennsylvania. Um, 
so it was just me treating patients and he was kind of working the front desk and answering the phones and helping us get set up with insurance yeah. um, contracts and that kind of thing. And then once his license came through and my caseload was built to the where we you know, were able to get him some patients, we started doing that. And within probably six months or so, we, we hired our first two employees just some that's, administrative help that was yeah that's you know, pretty solid huge, yeah it was great it's it was pretty quick i wish that we would have done it sooner because uh we were just like swimming with with work which was again yeah I mean, do you was homes. that so you said you were you kind of were going on facebook and through network mm -hmm. um did your or may, this might be tough to quantify but was your uh, hypothesis about the name recognition in the area do you think that actually help to jumpstart it? Like, did you get a lot of referrals that way or? I think that um, was like, I mean, I mentioned Facebook, but I would mm -hmm. say probably like in terms of traction and just getting some momentum, I think that was maybe 5%. If I had, if I okay. had to quantify it, if I had yeah. a percentage around it, less, maybe 90 plus 95% plus of our momentum was just word of mouth uh, around people that had known us, known our family, known me personally, known my dad or my mom personally. And, um, people talking like saying, Hey, the, those one set their boys, they've built a, yeah. a physical therapy practice. And if your back hurts, you should go see them, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was, it was That's, just that, like we didn't put any money in marketing. Like if we posted something on Facebook, it was just on our page that yeah. nobody was probably paying attention to. So it was, um, it was just almost all of, of what got us going was, was people, you know, just small communities, I think are tremendous at helping one yeah. another out. Yeah. At least this, this one seems to be that way. And, yeah. Uh, it's really cool. It was, it was really, it was exciting to see how that all played out and materialize. And I think that, uh, you know, I had a hunch that was going to be the case and I think, yeah. thankfully I was right. Yeah. Um, okay. So the client side that the, the referrals kind of helped through that. So what were some of the, um, when you were, yeah, well, I mean, when you were first starting out, you hired pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any any challenges with that? Like you you had had some management role, but as far as hiring, like um, were there any issues or any any chal any challenges with that? Or um, yeah, well, when we went to hire, we had, we hired two people at the same time, and one I, I knew that we needed to find somebody that could help us in some way navigate. If you're in healthcare, you you have to deal with insurance companies almost. I mean, if you can be, you could be a cash based practice or a cash, you know, yeah. a totally concierge cash type scenario. But we didn't want to go that route entirely because I feel like it was going to limit how many people we could serve, and and we didn't we didn't want to go that road. So I I needed some help. Like I mean, I have no background in, in terms of dealing with insurances, sending out invoices, sending out claims working with Medicare. Yeah. That's a totally different world. And, yeah. and, uh, thankfully we found somebody in our, in our community. She was matter of fact, our very, my very first patient, very first patient I ever had. She came to me because she had just had a knee replacement. We were still in construction mode. And <laughs> this was like right before her joint replacement. She was, she was scared about like how they were un, un, unsure on how all of her PT was going to go afterward. It had a ton of yeah. questions. She was pretty young to have a knee replacement, like 50, not even 50 years old. Oh, wow. So um, she uh, said she was interested in, in PT with me, with us once we were open. And so I was like, well, when's your surgery? We lined it up. And, and technically, I think I saw her like for a couple of visits before we were officially open with like, I mean, in every way, like I don't even think we had a building <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't, we hadn't had our like occupancy permit yet. And I'd seen her a couple of times. Like she's stepping over, you know, uh, lumber yeah, and yeah, the the electrical like cords and stuff. Yeah. Everything. Obstacle of course. Yeah. yeah. So, um, again, she was my first patient. And then she told me, she, she's like, if you're ever, she was working for the local health system and doing billing for them. And she said, if you're, you know, if you're looking to hire at some point, let me know. And so, you know, long yeah. story short, I ended up when, when it was time, I reached out to her and she was more than willing to jump ship and, and come That's cool. take the risk to, to work for some startup. And uh, thankfully, because she's been a tremendous asset, she's been with us you know, from that point, And she's she's one of our key. Yeah, that seems people. like a an important position to get right. Like they're all obviously you want to get them right. But some are I mean, some are more important to sure. get right than others. Yeah. And no that not. seems like especially in that industry, like that seems like if you don't get that right especially in your case, since you don't have the background in it, like mm -hmm. you and really have no idea how mm -hmm. it really worked. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. You need somebody good there. Yeah. You need somebody good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I put a ton of trust in her and, and she does a tremendous job. So I'm super thankful because, I mean, if it, it would just be bad if, if I was yeah. trying to navigate that myself, it just wouldn't have gone well. Yeah. It takes a certain personality too. Like you have to have some experience, but then she's really detail oriented, really just focused on task, like yeah. dots all over eyes, crosses all over T's. And, and that's just not how I operate. That's not how my brain works. Yeah. It's just, it, it would not be good. So, um, yeah, she's a huge blessing. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay. So what other, um, in that first, we'll, we'll say that before you hired, were there any major things that stick out to you as like, oh, this was a, this was a struggle. Was there anything, anything that sticks out like that? Or, um, was everything relatively smooth? Like how, how was that first six months? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I really can't think like looking back, I can't say, oh, I just was, I mean, I was swimming in terms of like trying to keep my head above yeah. water, keeping pace with all the different things that were coming at me in terms of trying to just get some contracts ironed out. Well, so if that, if, if there wasn't anything major, managing all of that, how did, I mean, that seems like that the struggle. That was the struggle so, for me, for sure. Okay, so, um, so how did you... Because I was treating patients full-time too, you yeah. know what I mean? I yeah, was, I, yeah, I, I mean, like every, case load. every business owner, you know, when you're starting, it's like, okay, I'm this per I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the marketing, I'm the person who does the work, I'm, I'm all of these things. Mm -hmm. How did you manage that? Did you have a... Um, did you have a, yeah, like how did you manage that? Did you have a, any tools that you used or just kind of, it just happened to work or like, how did you, how did you, how'd you manage that? Yeah. I still don't know that I'm managing it very well. <laughs> it's a trick, man. I think that a lot of business owners, this, this is my perception. A lot of business owners have a hard time taking that next, next step where they're able to really effectively manage themselves and other people yeah. in, in terms of getting the most out of yourself, the most out of the people around you, making sure that everybody's in the right seat. That's a really, that's a really difficult thing to do. And, and yeah. we're, I'm still by no means uh, ha have yet to master that skill. But I think really for me at the time, it was just doing what was in front of me that needed to be done. Did you? And I didn't have a strategy around it. Did you make, uh, like one of the things that I didn't learn until a little bit later, but like did you, did you use a list? Did you use, was there anything in particular that helped to like keep you on pace or was it just like, Oh, problem over here. Let's go do that. Oh, I just noticed another thing. Mm -hmm. Like, was that kind of what, what, uh, cause I know for me, like I kind of did that for a while and then realized it was driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I wasn't, I would forget things. So then I started making lists and then like more structured lists and I figured all that out. Okay. Um, but that's what works for me. Okay. But did you kind of, did you just start like, okay, problem, solve that problem. Yeah. Like I it's know pretty this, much that. Okay. It was pretty much just that. And, and I, I mean, my brother kept me on track to some degree. Yeah. My wife was down there helping too. She was answering the phones when she could, when she didn't have to worry about juggling <laughs> kids. And, and sometimes the kids would be down there with us and, yeah. uh, you know, she's just trying to manage answering the phones when, when she could, but so it was just all hands on deck. But I didn't, I, I mean, I'm not like an organized person. It's, yeah. it, that's not a, a skill that just comes naturally to me, you know, and, and I don't, up until just recently, I, I just started using some technology tools like Todoist, to which is, uh, yeah. if you're familiar, yeah. um, I'm not even like, I'm, I don't, I don't do that consistently. I, I'm not really like a consistent, uh, task oriented, stay mm -hmm. focused, type person my mind is like i've got a squirrel brain all the time okay i'm thinking about one thing then i don't finish that thing in my thought in my thought or mine <laughs> yeah. and i move on to this other thing and i think that that's it's helpful in, in some ways in terms of yeah. being able to manage a lot coming at you and not get completely overwhelmed yeah um not that that can happen that definitely can happen <laughs> yeah, so. yeah but it's it i think it is a skill in some ways or it's, it's not a skill but it's a strength in, in some ways for me yeah being a business owner but in other ways, it's been completely like there's I'm sure that there's so many different ways that it would be better to approach and attack yeah. it. Um, just keeping myself organized and, and on target and on focus. But uh, what do you use? So I, I've gone through several different um, several different tools. So I started trying to find like a project management tool. Mm -hmm. Um which I went, I tried so many. I tried Asana, Monday, I tried a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found, because I've always been by myself, mm -hmm. 
it took more time for me to enter everything that I was trying to do than it did to do something. <laughs> right. So it was like, ah, all right, this just, isn't, yeah, like, this just isn't working for me. Yeah. So then um, once I got my, this iPad, I found a, I, I like writing. Um, and I, we've talked about that uh, with different pens and, yeah. and different notebooks and things. Cool copper that. pens. Yeah. Um, but what I found, I finished a notebook or two and then realized, oh, I have notes in this notebook that I still need. Mm. And now I have three notebooks that I have to carry around. So yep. I was like, okay, well, this <laughs> isn't work. working. Yeah. Um, and I found Notability, which is fantastic with the, on iPad. So I have access now on my iPad, on my phone, um, not on my computer because I use Windows, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I, so for a while I was just writing notes in, in my, in notability. Um, and I would structure them as like, you know, uh, this is for one cellular physical therapy and everything that we did together would be within that note, okay. um, with meeting labels at the top. And then, you know, as we're talking, just take notes like you normally would in school or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and that helped me a lot. And then I was also using that. I have a, a task note and I would write, here's the things I need to get done this week. And here's the things that I need to do that are important and not, um, that works really well for me when I'm not working with people mm-hmm. because you can't read my handwriting and I know what's oh, going on Oh, it doesn't dictate or it doesn't like translate to no. a text thing. No. Okay, got so it. you can search handwriting, Okay. Uh, at least in the tool that I use. So I can search handwriting, but I can't, it won't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't translate it into text. Got it. So that would be kind of nice, but I kind of prefer because of the way that I I like my brain works. I end up with notes that are kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a whiteboard, like a giant mind map is what it ends up looking like. But it's nice because I can then move things around. I can circle this, move it down to here and and I can do all that. And I can embed pictures, which has been fantastic for taking notes in books. Oh, there you go. Okay. That's, that's, so that has been a big asset, big aside, big, big little or little tangent here but that has been the maybe the most valuable part of using it like this because i can now what i i i also could never find a way never figured out a good way to re um examine books or like go back to notes in books yeah um because you end up with a bunch of note or a bunch of sticky notes or a bunch mm-hmm. of notes within the book and i don't really like the way it looks when I write in the books and all of that. So right. uh, I didn't, didn't really have a good way. And then once I figured out I could embed pictures, now I can have my, you know, I have a note that is for a book. I take a picture of a page, highlight the things that are important within that page, write some notes on it. And now I never have to reference the book That's again cool. because everything um, that I found valuable is in a single note and I can scroll down through. And um, so that has potentially been the most the most useful part about using like a whiteboard style or notepad style. Yeah. I'll have um, to check that out. It, it's, it's a, it's a cool way to handle it, but that's how I was managing my own projects for a while uh, because it was taking so it just all of the little details. I probably missed some things and like, you're not creating great processes by just writing notes every time, but it was easier. Mm-hmm. It was easier. So yeah. um, it worked for me for a while. Um, but yeah, so you didn't have, and you don't use that, like, do you have a system for any of that? Or do you, how do you, how do you, I mean, you were just kind of tackling things as they came up. Um, but how, did you have a system for tracking what was happening or what was going on or what you needed to, to do? Or, um, I mean, obviously you guys grew pretty quickly like, mm-hmm. to hire within the first two people within the first or at six months around there. Mm-hmm. Um, you were doing well. Clearly. Yeah. So yeah. you had to have something like something had to, you couldn't have been aimlessly wandering. Yeah. Like no, we'll I wasn't that. aimlessly wandering. I was pretty focused. I mean, in terms of like where my energy was going, I was yeah, yeah, go, yeah. it was going into making yeah. sure that this thing was getting, get off the ground. People were getting served really well and, and we were following through. I think, that, you know, I've got an uncle who's, he's in construction, but he's, um, he's an attorney by trade started, okay. <laughs> Yeah, then he, he bought this small business, uh, like a um, office phone systems business back in the 80s when everybody, every single, I mean, you know, obviously still businesses have landlines. That's still a yeah. thing. Yeah. The way in which communication occurs in a business is different than how we just utilize our iPhones uh, personally. But he 
you bought this business and then it, it pretty quickly morphed into something that was way more substantial than all his other uh, law school buddies were, were doing from, from a revenue perspective. Uh-huh. Um, anyway, <laughs> then, then he started building how he renovated his house. Somebody in his neighborhood was like, Hey, can you do that for me? <laughs> That's now turned into like, he builds, you know, five to $25 million houses in, in, oh, wow. uh, in, okay. in, in Atlanta. But all that to say, I remember him and he said this to me multiple times, like essentially the basics are the basics, like blocking and tackling of business are following through with people, making sure that you're doing what you're saying you're going to do mm-hmm. and just, just being integral and doing the right thing, whatever yeah. that means. I mean, yeah. that's super vague, but like we all have some sense of like, if, if somebody calls you and says, I've got this question, can you help me? Or, you know, what do, what do you suggest? You don't just, you don't not follow up with them. You, <laughs> yeah. you call them back. Yeah. Or, um, you know, you, you, if you're going to meet somebody at two o'clock, you show up at one fifty five or two o'clock and you're there yeah. ready to go and yeah. you're not 30 minutes late. And, you know, it's just the basics, the, the most simple yeah. common sense, courtesy, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Doing that surprisingly takes you a long way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it yeah, shouldn't well, necessarily, but well, it does. It's that like customer service thing. Even you notice now it's like, well, when you run into good customer service, mm-hmm. it's fantastic. Yeah. And you notice it because yeah. most isn't like, you, I feel like most is average. Like yeah, it's not, you're not, like, not a be lot like, of bad. Right. You know, like, I think that's true. Not a lot of bad, but everything is very average. Right. Um, and when you have that that customer service person that goes above and beyond, or, which is normally not really above and beyond, it's just like, oh, you treated me with respect today. Right. You. Yeah. You like, smile and then this you was say pleasant. hello. You made this terrible ask one question somewhat about me. pleasant. Yeah. Right. Like, okay. Great. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's that that makes sense. So mm-hmm. you you had that going for you, obviously. Now, one of the things I mean, one of the things you're jogging my memory about is when when somebody would call way back in the day, and we still do this to this day. Um, somebody has low back pain, let's say, and they call in and they're hurting. You know, if, if you're compassionate and, and, you know, really invest some time into helping them get some clarity around their situation and what the next steps could be to help get them some resolution. Yeah. It's tremendously valuable yeah. to them and to you ultimately as yeah. a business. Yeah. Um, so we'd spend 20 or 25 minutes on the phone with that person, understanding who they are, what their issues are, what their hurdles are, what yeah. their goals are, concerns, fears, all that stuff. And, and we would take notes on it and, and, and then pass that information along to the person that's actually going to ultimately help that individual. Yeah. And initially that was just me. Yeah. My, yeah. Let's say my brother would be answering the phone and he would be talking to somebody and asking them a lot of questions about their low back pain, for example. Well, we've, we've continued that on. Like now he and I are the ones that are taking every phone call and then feeling those, those, those calls and, Allaying some of those people's fears, helping yeah. them get some clarity around what the next steps steps are, and uh, just trying to serve them out of the gate before they ever yeah. become a patient, because it, it just it it goes better for them, which ultimately goes better for you as a business. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, to circle back to what you're saying about in terms of like staying on track and organized. I hadn't thought about it until you started talking about a notebook. I do remember a yeah. conversation you and I had, had and, and I did, I kept a notebook. Like, I mean, I carried it around everywhere I'd yeah. go with me and I would just take notes. And I mean, it would be easy to reference back to, to yeah. like, okay, I, that was something I was supposed to do and just keep me on track and, yeah. and on target. Okay. And, um, so yeah, you had something, I mean, I did it's a similar system. That's, yeah. that's what I was, that's, I mean, we had like a 20 minute conversation on pens and paper the one day at Chico. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think we actually, it might not have been 20, but yeah, it could 10 be or 15 minutes. Yeah. Right. About pens and, and paper um, that we like to write on. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So uh, since then, so that would have been up to almost the beginning of the pandemic. Okay. So that would have been right around then. Um, obviously, like there's going to be some significant hurdles with that. You mm-hmm. have to see people um, and you can't see people during that time. Um, how did you, uh, we won't spend a ton of time on this, but how how were you able to kind of work through that? Um, how did you approach that? Pro- like I assume that was a pretty significant challenge. It was. Um, Especially yeah. so for some context, I think it was in July, July of 2019 is I assume maybe it was five months after we'd opened, we'd, we'd hired those two front desk, mm-hmm. like administrator 
type roles. And then my brother and I were just treating patients and, and just let them, letting them do most everything else for four, four or five months or something like that. And we were working 14, 12, 14 hours or whatever it was, whatever we needed to do. But yeah. we were so busy to the point where we hired two PTs within a month of one another in January and February of 2020. So March of 2020 rolls around and the whole world shuts down. And we had gone from, I don't know what our volume was, but it was cut in half, half. Okay. And from this, like right away, that's a problem. My, it was a problem, a problem because we had just hired these two PTs. And so now we've got, including my brother, we've got five people on payroll. And certainly I, I wanted to be cognizant and, and, and ensure that my patients were going to be safe and yeah. we're going to be at risk unnecessarily. But we never shut down, number one. Thankfully, we were we never had to close. Uh, although, our, like I said, our case though was cut in half because people were scared and nobody yeah. was going to the doctor and nobody was really yeah. wanting to go to PT. Though we still had, you know, like I said, half of our caseload. But my, truthfully, my biggest focus and, and where my mind was at when, when that pandemic hit was I don't want to let any of my employees go. I was like, I was hell bound to make sure that we weren't going to have to f- let somebody go. Yeah. And I just really yeah. didn't want to do that. I mean, I just made two hires, young kids, shortly out of school. And, and I just felt like a ton of um, responsibility to make sure I'm going to take care of my people. Yeah. And um, so we all, all the PTs now at that, at, the, at that point, it was four of us. We took kind of a, a two weeks of unpaid time and just rotated that time amongst the, the four of us. And um, we cut back from being open five days a week to we were closed on Fridays and we were only open Monday through Thursday and try to compress our patient volume within those four days, which yeah. ended up ended up working pretty well. And so by the time all of us PTs had taken a two weeks unpaid time off, uh, that was eight weeks and we were kind of out of it. Like we weren't completely out of yeah. um, how much COVID had affected our, our business and our yeah. volume, but we were way on the other side of it. Like yeah. We were climbing back up in terms of our volume. The revenue was starting to pick back up again and, and we had gotten some more momentum, um, recovered from, you know, the direction that we yeah. had gone. And so that was really kind of the, the whole focus and drive was like, I'm not letting anybody go. Yeah. And, uh, thankfully we didn't have to. That's, that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So that's a, when you, so when you made that decision to, with that approach, the, like, we're going to take two weeks off, like two weeks unpaid, kind of cycle that through. Had you, had you seen that done? Like, how did you decide that that was, that was the path? I, to be honest with you, I did, it wasn't like I had some, I hadn't consulted with anybody. Uh, it, it just seemed to me like that was a way just to. the logical. Yeah, the logical okay. opportunity. I mean. Who doesn't like having the yeah. uh, the idea of being off of work on Friday, even though <laughs> yeah. there's like some uncertainty and, and a little bit of, um, you know, there is obviously a ton of uncertainty yeah, around, yeah, around yeah, that yeah. whole situation. Yeah. But I think that people, my, my staff was, was aware that I was doing everything I could yeah. and I collaborate with them. Like, okay, what do you guys think about this? This is what I'm thinking about doing. Yeah. They're on board with that. Like yeah. getting feedback and asking their honest opinions and getting their perspective was certainly a part of that game, you know, yeah. so. Well, that, um, that goes a long way with employees too, just including them in those decisions, mm-hmm. well, including them in the decisions, even if you were already kind of leaning that way. It's like hearing them out, that's helpful. Totally. That I've, is super helpful because it, like I'm sure you experience like a lot of places don't have like management isn't giving you that opportunity for input, even if it doesn't, mm-hmm. even if you're not taking it, the right. fact that you're heard is like, okay, this is great. Like, I feel like I'm a part of the team. I'm yeah. not just being told what to do. Yeah. Some, some, somebody shaking their magic wand over you, yeah. like, you know, pulling this string. Cause I and, said so. Right. Uh, um, okay. So, so got through, got through the, the most difficult part of, of COVID, mm-hmm. um, that initial part. So since then, um, what kind of, um, what kind of challenges have you, what are the, what are the, um, there's something I want to come back to, but we'll, I'll, I'll hit that in, in a little bit. Um, what have you been dealing with since then? What are some of the things like you've continued to grow? Mm-hmm. I'm sure dealing with people, I might be wrong here. I've not had to hire anybody, but I feel like once you've got a couple people on staff, the more you grow, like there's going to be a, a limit to that. If you've got 
30 employees, that's different than 10. But mm. have you noticed any any differences with now you're up to, say, 15 people total? Mm-hmm. Um, any challenges with that or, or any other growing pains that you've noticed? Anything significant um, that you've kind of been working through or, or have gotten through? I think this has been my experience so far um, in the three years now we've been open and, and with the growth we've experienced. The growth highlights the areas that you are sucking at. <laughs> okay. And it really, it, it puts a spotlight on where you need to, to focus your energy and time. So, you you know, you asked me earlier how I'm managing myself and how I'm trying to figure out navigating moving forward. Yeah. I think that's that's still a struggle. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how, it, how do I put, because there's probably 500 things on in my mind that I need to do and that I need to focus some energy and yeah and and need to improve on but trying to identify the three or four that are going to be the the big dominoes that can fall and and knock out some of these other dominoes is where i need to put a lot of time and energy and 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 conceptualizing how do i attack those problems and what do i do about it Uh, what's my role how do i delegate versus how do i take some of these things on myself like all those things are are a challenge and i think that um again as, as we've grown highlighting the fact that we don't have systems in place for certain things really, really compounds in, in, yeah. a, in a negative way. So um, that's that's where I'm at. That's where most of my energy is going right now is trying to figure out what kind of systems can we create that are going to create a repeatable, scalable, yeah. high quality outcome um, with, with little variation. I mean, I love... Uh, I love autonomy and I, I think it's huge. I, I want to be able to give that to my employees. And I think we yeah. do that probably on, on a, on a much more um, deep and broad scale than most, most other companies that are yeah. similar to mine. However, creating some systems that are, that are just, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time yeah. is, is a huge thing. And, and we're just not there yet. So how are you, um, how are you approaching that? Like, are you, um, I think we ran into each other. It would have been a little while ago at this point, but you had switched soft, whatever the software was. Mm-hmm. And there were some challenges with that. How are you? Question one is, was that a part of that? This trying to figure out the processes and how are you, how are you going about figuring that out? Like, mm-hmm. are you testing a bunch of different tools? Are you, um, yeah, like where did where are you even starting? Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> what? Like it is overwhelming, that, especially at this be point because you're how many? Like you're three, four years in. Three years. Yeah. So there's a lot. Like you've mm-hmm. got three years of figuring out how to take all of these things and make them a coherent and repeatable, mm-hmm. scalable process. Like how how are you approaching that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. <laughs> you, have, you have any ideas? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of our, our software, I think we're we're kind of through that. Like when we talked about it a few months ago. We had just been in this process of, of changing our software, which is how we, as, as a clinician, how you document everything you've done, any intervention you've done with a patient, yeah. what you think the diagnosis is, all that. Like the, our billing is done through this, our, our scheduling is done through this software. So that's a big undertaking to switch gears. Yeah. And then at the what same time. To that, what led to you doing that? What caused the switch? Yes, it was really for me. It was, it was not like, um, so you've got a few different interfaces for for a physical therapy software, for probably any healthcare software. You've got the the clinician side, which is where you document and and note what you've done, what what diagnosis there is, et cetera. And then you've got the billing aspect of it. And then you've got like the data side of it. So the, um, for the software we had been using, the, the clinician side and the billing side were pretty good. Like we didn't have too many issues and hangups with those, but the data that we were getting, they had, they had transitioned from, a, from a one UI, one user interface to, yeah. to another. They totally updated things. And I think that they pulled the trigger way too soon on that switch. And so it was just giving bad data on the back end okay. for me, like really basic things, helping me uh, understand some KPIs that, that, that our business needs to, to have, I need to have a sense of yeah. with our business. We were just not getting good information on. So 
that was really the big impetus for me to, to make a switch because I thought, okay, well, it'll, we'll give it a couple months and they'll iron out all these bugs and, and, um, it'll be cleaned up. And it, and it wasn't. wasn't, it was like six months of, That's of a just problem. poor data that yeah. was, was really affecting our, um, our business in a negative way. So yeah. just not knowing how to steer the ship and, and make sense of what you're seeing was just not, not helpful. So we made that switch and, and that has been tremendously better you know like yeah the, obviously there's just going to be growing pains anytime you make a switch like that this yeah, is tough it's your, but your main system your lifeblood like switching that's like okay yeah well, there's going to be a little bit of a rough patch yeah you guys. like we're going to get through it but we're going to there's going to be a lot of changes so yeah. i was listening to this podcast this physical therapy podcast specifically and the guy was it was about employee compensation models like changing an employee compensation model from a traditional, like you have a salary and maybe a yeah. little opportunity for a bonus here or there to a much more profit sharing, uh, profit distribution type yeah. model, uh, which I'll be obviously a little bit more, I mean, it's just non-traditional. So, um, you know, there's some apprehension around that. If you're a, if you're a physical therapist and yeah. the unknown as a business, as a PT owner yeah. for me, but the, the podcast host was saying, Outside of changing EMRs, electronic medical records, EMR. So in healthcare, that's that's how you do the documentation. Yeah. All this. So outside of doing that, the biggest um, hurdle you're going to have to face is is changing an employee compensation model. And we did that. At, we did both of those things at the exact same time. So I, was, I just laughed at myself. I'm hearing okay. this in this podcast, and the guy is like saying, basically, the two things that you're doing right now, Cliff, are are the the two biggest challenges oh you're going to face God. in your business. And I was okay. like, okay, well, I don't, might as well jump in with two feet. Everything else should be easier, I guess. <laughs> I guess. So um, to answer your question, though, how are we doing it? Really, up until very recently, you know, if you think about, like, and I'm sure that every org chart is a little different for every organization, but to some degree, you've got four different, uh, below the CEO, you've got four different categories. You've got sales, marketing, operations, and finance. Yeah. And I had my hands and all of them, you know, I was still treating patients. So that's operations. Yeah. Trying to manage the front desk and, and understand how they're doing their job, which I was doing a poor job at because <laughs> I just didn't spend the time, energy, resource around training, um, policy procedures, stuff that I just don't gravitate toward and don't yeah. get excited by. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, like there wasn't anybody else that had filled that seat and, and then I had delegated to, to give them that responsibility. Yeah. And then I was trying to put energy in sales and marketing and then try to also understand the financial aspect of, of our business and, you know, profit and all that. And I, I got to the point where I understood that I needed to give some of it away. Mm -hmm. So my brother's been in, been this thing uh, from the jump with me, Charlie. And, and so just recently he and I decided, okay, operations is, is going to be all you like, I mean, I'm still, I still can help him and, and yeah. he doesn't have a ton of management experience. And so not that I do, but I've got way more yeah. experience than he does. Yeah. So he and I are going to work on this together, but you know, I've, I've kind of recently passed the torch of operations to him so that I can focus on these other three pillars, which, uh -huh. you know, again, sales, marketing, finance. And, um, I've got people that are now, we're starting to get to the point where we've got some specialization that's occurring because yeah. early on when you're a startup, as you mentioned earlier, every, every entrepreneur is wearing 25 different hats yeah. all within one single day. Once you get to the point, and I don't know where this is or where this was for us exactly, but I'd say in the last eight months or so, uh, once we got to a, around eight or 10 employees, we got to the point where we were able to start getting some people in a little more clearly defined seats in those different categories. Yeah. And it's been, it's been helpful to be able to understand what you're, what the hell you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah. How do you spend, if you're eight, working eight or nine hours a day, how are you supposed to be spending that time? Yeah. And, and putting some definition around it and helping people understand what, success looks like how do you know if you're doing a great job like we still don't have a lot of those things built out to where our employees know like today today was a good day and this yeah. is why it was a good day because i did these things and this completely aligns with the overall mission of where we're going and what my role is in it and it's just it's tough to do all that but um you know, you need to be able to give people that so that they can feel like, okay, I've got a, I've got a handle on how this is all supposed to go Yeah. versus like just every day is just a, a yeah. shit storm of things coming at you and you just react all the time. Yeah. That's, 
Okay. So with with all these people, are you so you've had your hand in basically all of it since the begin all not basically all of it since the beginning. Um, are you are you starting to and, and you mentioned you you didn't have any real like guidelines. Uh, maybe there were some guidelines, but there wasn't a a real strategy for bringing people on mm-hmm. um, or or knowing how to keep consistency within that. Um, but I get, I mean, this kind of goes back to the processes thing. Cause it seems like this is the biggest, your biggest hurdle right now. Um, how, how is that going? How is, how is it going? Like you keep growing every time I talk to you, you've got more people. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you, how is it going? Like, are, is it, is it getting easier to bring people on? I guess that's a, a clear way to say it. Is it is the process for bringing people on and getting them up to speed? Is that getting better? I think we're moving in the right direction. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think. I mean, <laughs> I can't say with certainty. Direction. Maybe you should yeah, interview yeah. somebody else and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and have them really tell you. Yeah. But I, I do think that we're moving in the right direction, and I think this is a lesson I'm trying to teach myself right now, and it's it's really hard to do. And I think that most entrepreneurs it resonates with them to some degree, like. There's probably a certain personality type or something within most entrepreneurs that that makes you think you want to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. That also yep. um, has you thinking, shit, I got to get better at this and this and this. It's a, it's mm-hmm. a responsibility and a, and a risk and responsibility paradigm that um, is, is probably within most entrepreneurs. Well, but I wonder if that is more of it's within them or at the beginning, everybody is trying to do everything themselves. So you get accustomed to, Oh, I, I, we're not doing this well. I have to do it better. Um, it's probably both, man. But, but I think that you're probably not starting a business and thinking you can make it go. If you don't feel like I'll do that, I can, I can do that. I can make it happen. I can do it. Um, we'll figure this out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think um, that's the mentality. We'll figure it out. Yeah. I don't know how, but we'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause if, if you're the type of person that's paralyzed by the unknown and, and just navigating the chaos, which is really what starting a business is, is, yeah. is just managing chaos. And I mean, the worst case scenario, if you're starting a business is you've got crickets and you've got nothing to do and you don't have any clear direction. Even if you don't have a clear direction, you just don't have something that you feel like you can put your energy and focus and mind to. Uh, and you've got no customers to serve and, and no pursuit yeah. on how you're going to make that all happen. That's a bad situation to be in. Yeah. So thankfully we never were there. Um, but we've had a hell of a lot of chaos and a lot of unknown and trying to create some order around all those things has been, has been a trick. But I think the, the lesson that I think, you know, I'm trying to teach myself is it's okay to not be there yet. Yeah. I think it's really important to make sure that your trajectory is right and you're not going in the, you know, you're yeah. not going in the wrong direction. Yeah. You're headed in the right way. You're headed to, towards the thing, mm-hmm. but you're just not there. Like, yeah. It's like, I know where we're trying to go. Right. And the decisions we're making, they're, you know, they're kind of working their way there. Mm-hmm. Like that's the clear goal and we're definitely get it going there, mm-hmm. but we're not there. Yeah. That's okay. And that's okay. Right. I think yeah. that's really a hard thing for me and probably some other people can resonate with this or resonates with, but being, being cool with the fact that you don't have it all figured out and that things aren't perfect. It's all right. You know what I mean? And that's, that's not easy for me. Yeah. Not that I'm, I'm not a perfectionist by any means, but like, but I'm, I can be hard on myself Yeah. and I can expect a lot in a short period of time and knowing what you're doing right now, taking some small incremental changes and, and making minor tweaks and, and just, keeping steady on the course yeah. is going to pay off in the long run. It's, it's really, it's really easy to get frustrated for me, at least to get frustrated. Like, why aren't we there? Why haven't I figured this out yet? Why haven't yeah. I taken the, the time to build this out in the way that I think is going to serve me well, but taking some, taking bite-sized chunks and realizing that, you know, you're, you're heading in the right direction. Things are going to continue to improve if you stay focused on making yeah. it happen. Um, and whether or not it happens in six months or three months or three years, like as long as it goes, keeps going in the right direction, you'll make continual evolutionary steps to, to getting where you want to go. It's all good. You know, and that's hard. Yeah. 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 That's, um, 
super easy to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> super yeah. easy to talk about. Right. Not very easy to, uh, not very easy to get to that point though. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Uh, any, um, I guess we'll kind of, we'll kind of start to wrap it up. What, um, any other mass, like <clears throat> any other big things that stick out to you as, wow, like I'm struggling with this or if no, cause it doesn't seem like there, it seems like the whole time has been like kind of controlled chaos. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not controlled, just like somewhat orderly chaos, I guess. Like we're keeping the wheels on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> everything's moving. There's yeah. no, like I haven't lost any wheels, you know, mm-hmm. everything is kind of moving in the right direction and has been, and we're controlling it. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that you, obviously it's easy to say like, Oh, I wish I would have done this earlier, um, for a lot of things, but, um, you, you probably, it probably wasn't actually the right time for you to do those things. Like maybe hiring earlier. Um, was there anything that that you wish you would have done? Like I'll ask the question, but is there anything that you wish you would have done better earlier? Let's let's say that not Mm. that you would have done earlier, but done better earlier. That was like an easy thing that, that when you noticed it, it was like, Oh wow. Like why haven't I been doing this? This would have been so helpful. Well, that's, that's, I don't know. I I can't really say that I have a clear answer to that. I would say that, um, you know, we we talked about COVID and I think I've told you this in person before, but COVID was, was a, like somebody else hit the reset button. You know, it wasn't me doing that, Yeah. but it was a tremendous blessing for me personally because it forced me, I, I didn't say this earlier, but when I was talking about how I had, um, my, my, full intention was to make sure I was going to take care of my people and, and not have yeah. to let anybody go. And, and I really felt like I'm, I mean, those, those people were my family and yeah. I, I wanted to take care of them. Like they were my brothers or sisters or kids. Yeah. Um, but by doing that, it, it pulled me out of patient care to some degree. You know, I, I, I still on the other side of like, when we started coming up, I was still maybe seeing 20, yeah. you know, like half of a caseload, let's say, and I was spending half of my time doing all the other, other, other things that only I could do. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that I would have gotten there if COVID didn't force yeah. me to take that step. Huh. So um, I would say that if, if that didn't occur, I would have told myself, I would have told my you know past self, stop doing what somebody else can do yeah. and focus on the things that only you can do or only, only decisions that you should be making. Yeah. Not to, not to say that you don't incorporate people in your yeah, uh, yeah, decisions but, like we but talked about. Overall, but overall, I mean, you're the only, like, yeah. you can't, it's that, like, you can't expect everyone to have the same love and, and investment. Investment. And, so right. there are decisions that you, I mean, you're the only, like, mm-hmm. that, that's part of That's your That's gig. part of it. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're the one you that took makes, it on. like, you might incorporate other people in the decision making, but the final decision is really, in most cases, it's up to you. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. being able to, to, yeah, I mean, you've got to be the one that forces that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, think about how many how many people that start a bakery, they're just baking cakes all day. Yeah. And they, they love baking cakes, so they start their own business. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess this could, this point could be argued, but I would imagine that there are a lot more people that can bake a cake than own a bakery and operate a successful bakery. You yeah. know what I'm mean? saying? So, yeah. like, yeah. let people that could, somebody else that can bake a cake, yeah. bake a cake while you figure out how to actually make those cakes yeah. sell and make them profitable and all yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Not everybody wants to do that, but that was for me that the start from the start, I knew I wanted to like, I wanted to be able to scale at, in a significant fashion and, and create a business that was repeatable without me having to do the actual production, yeah. which for me is, is yeah. treating patients full time. Uh, so that would be my advice would be just to my, to my old self would be, you know, pull out sooner and, and let yeah. somebody else, are it's you, really good how to do it. Now that. that you're doing less or are you doing, I really, really see almost no, no patients now. Do you, do you miss that? I don't do you miss it, the production. Side? No, I don't. I mean, okay. I, I love talking to people. I love learning about their lives. I love helping them feel better, but I've got, I've got seven other physical therapists that are just as good or better yeah. at it than me. Yeah. I get a ton of pleasure in knowing that the people, the patients that are coming to see our PTs are having a remarkable experience 
getting this transformation and, and, and taking their lives in a different direction in a, in a really positive way. Yeah. That, that fuels me. I don't, I don't need to be doing that. Yeah, I don't, I don't need to be facilitating that for yeah. my patients. I love, and I get a ton of satisfaction in knowing that we've, we've created a system where that is, is a regular outcome. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I feel like that's something that everybody, not everybody, a lot of people, it's like, well, I'm going to, I want to do this. I like baking cakes. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's why I started. Right. Baking cakes. Mm -hmm. um, But especially in your case, well, I guess that's, that's kind of a a good way to think about it, which is the um, sure you like baking cakes, but do you like baking cakes or do you like the, the response of people eating your cakes? And if that's the case, I mean, you might actually just like baking cakes. Yeah. Um, But if you like to be able to, to have the joy of somebody eating your cake, well, if you run the business better, if, if you focus on the other stuff, now you can feed more people. Like yes, yeah. more people can experience the joy of your cakes, um, which is kind of, it seems like the, you, you wanted since, since your goal was to help people, mm. um, not, it, it, it didn't really have to be you doing the work. No. It's just, Oh, I can help more people by making this thing bigger. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I we get to help more people. My goal is that we're going to help more, way more people, yeah. meaning patients, and then we have greater gonna, impact now. Yeah, greater impact, and then I also, I love the fact that I get the opportunity to give that kind of opportunity to a physical therapist to, because and I know we didn't talk about the structure of my business, but we really value placing a lot of time in between the patient and the provider. Yeah, that, that's what really our our model hangs its hat on. Yeah. And so the fact that I get to create an environment where a physical therapist gets to do what they love to do, the reason why they went to, to be a physical therapist yeah. in the first place versus just churning out patients all day, seeing, you know, 20 or 30 patients yeah. as opposed to my, my PTC at a most, at, at most eight patients a day. So <laughs> the, the, the fact that they get a lot of time to do what they love to do, it, it gives me a ton of joy and it yeah. makes me really excited that I not only get to, have a, a greater impact in terms of the number of patients that we could serve, but also yeah. the, the number of physical therapists that I can help live out their, their, yeah. their career and, and their ambitions and intentions and their love and passion. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that seems like the, uh, the thing that it, it's not the right way because, but it no, is a way. It's, it's not the right way. It's no, way. It, it was the right, I yeah, think it was the, the right, right thing for me. You. Yeah. Right. It's the right way for you. Um, cause somebody else might be like, I don't want to help more. I, yeah. I like doing the yes, work. Yes, this is what I I like am passionate videos. about. I don't care how many people I edit videos for. I just want to edit videos. Sure. That's it. Yeah, all good. Um, okay. Uh, any, anything else to add? And if not, um, where uh, I'll have the, I'll have your website and everything in the, um, down on the show notes and the summary and all that good stuff. But uh, any, any last um, parting parting words. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, I, I know I was pretty candid and transparent on how I've sucked at, at building out a lot of systems and, and we're yeah. not where we want to be as an organization. But I think that if you demonstrate and really live out the fact that you care about your people and and help them understand that uh, where you're coming from, what you're, what you're, mm-hmm. how you value them, they're going to be way more gracious with you and understanding that you know, things are going in the right direction, yeah. like like we talked about earlier. So yeah. I think that's a huge and part of it. And I think what might be kind of interesting, not today, but maybe we'll we'll reconvene at some point, is um, because of the type of business and the the, the structure and, and the way that you are operating, it feels like your culture, from what I've experienced, is good. Yeah, uh, you like you've got a nice team culture. So it might be kind of interesting to figure out how you how you were able to develop that and, mm-hmm. and how you keep that that moving in the right direction, but, um, yeah, another parting thought. This is, this is my company's Bible. It was my personal like business Bible. Ray Dalio, uh, he's an investor. His book called, it's called principles or one of them. And, uh, that book is tremendously, it's been tremendously valued to me personally and and to us as an organization. One of the things that he says that really stuck out to me is the two things you need to get right in business are the culture and the people. You have to get the right people, Mm -hmm. but you also have to create a culture that values people and values the, you know, what, what you embody. And so, yeah, I think that that's, that's really it. I mean, culture and people is, um, you know, if you don't have those two things figured out, 
it doesn't matter what kind of systems and processes you have in place because you've missed on probably the two biggest points. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to, uh, at some point we'll get back together then once you're probably up to 25 people and <laughs> yeah, maybe need a new space. But, <laughs> I um, hope we get there soon. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. I'll include all of your, um, all of your information down in the summary. Um, wansettlerpt.com is that the website that's the website okay. yeah um instagram same everything. yeah i think it's, it's just all one settler physical okay. therapy if you search on facebook or instagram or youtube we've got some content and okay. we're trying to produce more and more so uh yeah that's that's been a big shift we're we're, we're getting in the right direction and we've got a, a young kid evan who's who's doing a yeah, good job on that well. yeah he's doing really well um, all right, cool. Well, thanks for uh, being guest number two on the show. And um, I'm honored. Till next time. Yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. Thanks, Riley. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you're consuming this. I'm your host, Bradley Martin, and this is Clearing the Way, a resource for small business owners.